South County Brewing Company was founded and built by longtime brewer J.R. Heaps. Located in the town of Fawn Grove in York County, Pennsylvania, South County opened in 2011. Founder and brewer J.R. is a man who knows beer and brewing, as we discovered when he was a guest on Beer Busters podcast back in episode 30. Recently, J.R. acquired a new 15-barrel brew house and invited us to stop by to chat, have a few beers, and check out the new system. So, J.R., these are the four standby beers that you're going to have. Do you want to take us through and talk about each one? Absolutely. Uh, so, we'll start with the one here on the left, which is our Session ZSB. Um, it's a 4.5% Session style British Pale, and we use uh, Maris Otter as the base malt in this, and caramel malts. Um, we use uh, Noble Hop varieties uh, in it. We use an English London ESB strain, uh, a little demerara sugar, and uh, you know, ferment at typical, a little bit higher temperatures, probably 70, 72 degrees to bring out some more of the fruit character. Um, so this one's going to be a nice, light, crisp beer, but still a good malt body to it. Um, you're going to get subtle notes of toffee, especially as the beer ages from the demerara sugar, and uh, a little bit more of the honey, lemon, kind of tea and herb flavors, not so much the you know, citrus type variety flavors in that one. So going down the line next we have my personal favorite, the black yeah, cowgirl. The black cowgirl. The I be- believe we talked about it on the show. Yeah, yeah, the beer that was only supposed to be done once that kept selling <laughs> so we kept making it. Um, so that one there is a it's a double black IPA. Uh, we do it a little bit roastier than a lot of other breweries just because I I like the balance of that in it. Some people I've even seen on reviews comment that it's kind of like, a, they're like, oh, it's kind of like a porter. And it's like, eh, there's still a lot of hop character there, too. But that's a thing. It's like we're not brewing it to a stop, but we have to label it somehow to try to sell it. So double black IPA for that one. Uh, 8% alcohol, uh, Bravo, Columbus, some heavy hitter hops in there. Um, and uh, it's been a great re- relationship with the band. Uh, it's obviously an interesting name that catches people's ears. And next is the beer that started it all, the yep, first one. Yep, the America Ale, just a simple, <laughs> humble style that do- isn't, isn't as sexy as some of the other ones, but uh, we definitely love that one as well. Uh, 6.3% alcohol, uh, Amarillo Centennial, uh, Maris Otter Malt again, Victory Malt. You know, so once again, a lot of that biscuity chill, caramel flavor to it uh, with, with a little bit of the citrus orange notes. Um, and uh, yeah, that one's just, you talk about like a, a, a rich fatty burger beer, it's, it's, it's killer for a barbecue. Um, and then the newest gun to the table, which is our Day Rider, uh, which we're pretty proud of. Um, as we talked about before, you know, there's a big session movement in the scene. We want to be able to enjoy beer, but be responsible. And everybody live to see another day. So, you know, we definitely want to have some offerings that are low alcohol. So this is a 4.2% beer that uh, it's just got a ton of pungent, you know, tropical grapefruit, all those good aromas, um, a decent enough balanced body in it, um, and just an easy throwback beer. You know, we love it. So Excellent. Well, I'm ready to drink. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> We spent a small fortune just in this alone, and we went the extra mile and went with the more expensive equipment. One, because it was readily available, and two, I, I'm not too keen on the whole, like, let's buy Chinese stuff that's rebranded. This is all, well, it's German steel mm-hmm. that's built in Slovenia and sold as Italian, if that makes it complicated enough for you. <laughs> but Prospero is a very, very, you know, they're, they're like the creme de la creme in the distillery and winery fields all over, all over the country. And, the rep was amazing. The guy is like, I have him on speed dial. It'll be two in the morning. I'm like, why isn't this working? And he'll he'll be like, oh, do this, do that, you know. And uh, just little stuff like trying to learn some of the nuances of the machine. But overall, you know, going from where I because I brewed on big systems, small systems, everything in between. This brew house is like super intuitive and super yeah. easy. Even to the extent that the louder is, it's just a gravity fed louder. It's not even like a research. So it's almost like homebrew all over again. But it, but it works great because it keeps the hot side aeration down because there's no open wart grant. Um, and you see here, these are laser, laser edged grid floor on a box pattern, and uh, it just did water fantastic. Even when I have a super deep grain bed like the Black Cowgirl, um, between, between the malt load and what I can put in the kettle, neither sugars or extract, this system without doing like a, like a double cast, like actually doing two mashes into a single part of the kettle, I'm at like eight or nine percent. You know what I mean? Beers. And I don't really brew too much above that. I mean, we have one Imperial IPA that we might bring out as a seasonal, but um, overall, we're, we're super happy with the equipment. And it's just the, everything, even to this has a flow meter turtle line from the match. So it tells me what temp and how fast and what rate the water going in is. So I can actually, for once in my brewing career, really focus on my liquor to grist ratio, which is super important for enzyme you know, production as well as efficiency. Um, and 
I've been I've been doing a little bit of different mash technique where I'll go ahead and I'll drink some of the initial first wort out and then bring in the hot water and it seems to strip a little better through the mash bed um, and get a little bit of efficiency. So right now we're probably at like 84%. We're working to notch that up, but 84 is still not bad for a small machine like this. Biggest thing being the deep louder bed, that's what kills you. You know, the, the bigger efficiencies come when you can do an 18 inch bed that's like mm-hmm. you know, spread out. So um, so yeah, we've been super happy with it. All steam, so it just rips, you know. Plus we have temperature control, so we have steam on this jacket, steam on this jacket, and the two jackets on the cut here. So it, it'll rock and roll, and boil overs are definitely an ever-occurring event, you know, because we have to vent the top because if you leave the lid shut, it builds up just too much pressure. Next thing you know, you can open it up, it's like the phone flying at you. So. My business partner, Zero Business, has a guy that's um, just a brilliant plumber, and to me, this is probably one of the nicest, cleanest insoles I've ever seen as far as oil piping, light haul. Um, we have to get water on demand, so we try to conserve water so that we don't have to keep the hot liquor tank. If we, like, we're not brewing today, if not maybe doing something like cleaning something else. We have up to 180 degrees on demand that really conserves water and saves energy, so we're trying to you know, be mindful on that front. I have the luxury of both hot and cold glycol. So when we do loggers, you know, eventually we're going to try to do something. I mean, we're, we're going to be rocking with these four four brands, but I have the ability to ferment the logger, uh, warm it back up after primary to hit a de-rest, and ex- you know, accelerate that aging process so that we can get it chilled back down and into a tr- true loggering time period. You know, we're not worried about, because trying to, trying to do a de-rest at 50 is very, very hard, naturally. So, you know, the yeast at that point, once they're done fermenting all the, the primary uh, sugars in there, Warming them back up to 68, even though they are a longer strain, I found doesn't really hurt them, and they do a great job of, of wringing the beer out, and making it really clean, and then we recrash it back down. So yeah, these are our little 15-barrel war forces. Uh, we're outfitted for two more tanks. Uh, we can go up to. We could probably fit 60-barrel tanks in here, but I don't think as a whole that works well as far as actually brewing. I mean, I like double batching, but when you start getting into triple and quad batching. You just really got to be set on board. So I think the most we'll ever have in here is probably 30s with match and bright, but we can do up to eight fermenters and two, two brights in this, in this facility. So, um, we also have these killer hygienic racking arms. So a lot of times the old tanks used to actually be like a gasket seal. You would loosen until it starts dripping and you pull it, right? Well, these are actually hygienic. So they, they're literally made to spin, and they spin free as can be, and you can lock them out. So when we're doing filters or yeast crops, I actually can throw a cycle glass on one and actually select yeast based on color, consistency, as well as when we're filtering, we can get down to the last drop without having to do a cone blow and we can lose a lot of beer. So we, we just keep running the filter until we start to see foam naturally and we keep push, 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 and as soon as you see that first pump of, puff of whatever it is, we cut it off and we're done. So we've been able to really get good uh, good transfers into the right tank, saving beer once again, trying to max that out. So. And then the bottom line is our little pride and joy because we, we built that ourselves from scratch. Uh, which it's been a small feat, but it saved us a hell of a lot of money and talks a lot about packaging, which I think is super important because, you know, uh, knowing how to stuff bottles on the machine is one thing, but knowing how it works, I think ultimately helps you package really, really well um, and get good airs on the shelves and, and beer that can, can last a while. So we're, we're pretty excited about it. Um, so basically, other than the pack on table, which we bought used, and the two pieces of conveyor, everything else, the fabricated, welded, placed, um, you know, custom machine like this block, this stuff here. My brother programmed and designed the box here. So he does all the programmable logic control because there's all these interlocks and how you know, this thing talks and works. Um, all the welding fabrication here, the block, the set, I mean, everything we can make, hand fitted and put together to make it work. So, um, pretty, pretty involved. It, it took us a ton of man hours, but uh, it's amazing that we have a pack on, pack off machine within like a 16 by 3 foot footprint, which is pretty amazing. And we're running this machine right now. We're actually having to dog the fill time because we're working on some other parts of it, but we're at like 30 cases an hour. We know we can probably do 45 to 50 for the heat. It obviously works automated. I mean, literally, our our, our efforts that we do is we we put bottles on, automatically labels, automatically fills, automatically caps, and then packs on. So we're going to add some features, like some air knives up front. We've noticed that the labels, every now and again, even if you sanitize and make sure you drip the bottles really well, it, you get a little spot of water on it. So we're going to be we're going to be doing like an air knife here, and then we're going to be doing a, uh, a sensor activated solenoid valve and post rinse with another air air knife just to make sure the bottles are a little bit drier. We're always learning. You know, that's the thing about it. You get into something like this, but 
it's amazing that when you learn the technology of how to double pre evac, counter pressure fill, and the different things that go on with a machine like this, um, it really helps you understand packaging and, and put a better product. artisan friends that are blacksmiths and other stuff so if, if you're a baker or like I said in that article you know if you're a baker or if you're something you know where you're you're doing something uniquely different than like a, a commercialized version of it and granted yes we can all say that the quality in any instance in any medium should speak for itself but I still think there's a channel of communication for me and I'm not saying that's right or wrong or indifferent but for me that you know when I talk to my friend who's a blacksmith he says he's an artisan you know, or somebody say they're a craftsperson, you know, or, or how do you differ, differentiate between somebody who runs a commercial machine shop and somebody. So for me, I think it's truly important. I think a lot of those artisans would argue in favor of, you know, labels. I know we can, we can say, oh, they're not important or whatever, but we do it in music. We do it in the automotive fields. We do it in everything we do to try to communicate through certain channels to clarify what we're talking about and what we identify.